Yes, Pink Lady. When somebody says, Oh, Sister So and so did me wrong and tells you how she did it to you, then you get to thinking about it, but she didn't do me too good either with the so and so. And the next thing you're off to the road. In our lifetime, there will be many challenges that present themselves to us, or many temptations, which is what you're going to say. There will be right decisions, but there will also be wrong decisions. It's simply called life. And life is all about decisions, isn't it? Yeah. It's simply the, the decision to either talk about somebody or not talk about somebody. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. Amen. There are decisions that tell us uh, we ought to turn the television off. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Set no wicked thing before your eyes. There is other temptations that we must some kind of way learn to deal with in our lifetime. It is in our best interest to learn early how to make right decisions. Although we struggle with right or wrong, and sometimes it seems to be easier to live with a choice than to change it. Now think about that. Just think, if I was starting off three, four years old, praying for an hour every day, today I'd probably just pray for five or six hours without missing it. If when I was three or four years old, of course I didn't start being late to go there in life, but if I would have learned the proper foods to eat, I wouldn't have diabetes tonight. Amen? Now you got any kind of sickness concerned with the way you eat or the way you live? Mm. If a drunkard would have quit drinking, he may not have died of cirrhosis of the liver. Amen? If a cigarette smoker would have quit smoking, he may have not died of cancer. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we see right and wrong decisions that we've made in our life. Right. If you never ever hated anybody, you probably wouldn't hate today. Amen. But on the other hand, if you would have never ever loved anybody, then you wouldn't know how to love today. But it's no doubt early in life, it's easier to make decisions rightly than to go down the wrong path. As a Christian, when, received the, when we receive the Holy Ghost, then it is very easy at that moment to begin to put away everything that possesses. What well, Paul says, lay aside every, every sin and weight. Which, so he did not just say sin, he said weight too. Right. Anything that holds you down. Mm -hmm. We can refer to this as running a race. Paul says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a crowd, cloud of witnesses, lay us aside every weight and sin which do so easily beset us. Easily beset us. You know why he said that? Because it's easy to give in to temptation. Mm -hmm. And he says, and let us run the race with patience. Yeah. Without patience, it's even harder to lay aside wrongdoing. The race that is set before us, the struggle with wrong and right, we see others do things that we have been taught that was wrong, and we say nothing happened to them, so we think we can move in that direction. You may see someone jump off the Mississippi River Bridge, and he may be an excellent swimmer. 
He may be an excellent diver, and he may be a fluid. But if you jump off the Mississippi River Bridge without an F, you break your neck the time you hit the water. Or lose your breath on the way down and die. And when we talk about patience, so many of us lose out to temptation simply because we don't have the patience to keep God in the race. Well, my goodness, everything in the world is coming against me. I, I just bought a new car and a motor for another. Got home the other day and my wife and packed the bags and left. My house burnt down, my son broke his leg, and my daddy's on, on crutches. What's that really got to do with your deciding to do what's right or to live for God? We must understand that we cannot, we cannot do for other people. We can't make other people do what we know they need to do. You can't force anybody's hand. But you can make a choice in your life that I'm not going to allow temptation to drag me down. Sometimes when we've made a bad choice, as Christians, I don't know about people who are not Christians, even, the, even people who are not Christians, it may not be a spiritual thing, but uh, if you've made a bad choice, whether spiritual or, or physical, the first thing you want to ask is, how did I get here? You got there by not doing what you knew was right or being obedient to the Word of God. We made a choice to do what we did without seeing what the Bible had to say about it or thinking about what Scripture said. Then we ask, what do I do now? We repent. Jesus said, if you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus uh, uh, simply said this, letting us know that we have a right to repent. Now, what we really need to understand is what true repentance is. <coughs> Most people think it's saying, oh, God, forgive me. And that is also true. Uh, Paul said, it's whosoever confesses with their mouth. But you know why he said that? He wasn't talking about you just telling God you did wrong. But you can't change something that you're doing wrong unless you admit to it. You confess also with your mouth. Not just that Jesus is Lord or that Jesus is your Savior. But you need to straighten your life out and change it by simply turning all the way around and making a new direction. Saying, Lord, I'm going to live a better life. Turn from the wicked way or the divisions we made and come under submission to the Lord. Famous scripture tells us that if we submit ourselves unto God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. What's the next temptation in life? You think about this, we all, we all real quick to say, well, it was an evil temptation that caused me to do it. Was not most nine out of ten times it was your flesh. What your flesh wanted. That's the temptation that you need to learn to control. Jesus said that he made a way of escape. And there is a way of escape from all things. You may have to persevere a little bit. You may have to wait a little while. Isaiah 40 and 31 said, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. You'll get strength when you wait upon the Lord. 
Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is when we have patience to see what God wants us to see, then our lives will begin to change and we can begin to walk in victory. Somebody say that. Walk in victory. Walk in victory. We are so run down during the day because we haven't took not one step in victory. Seems to have been defeat all day long. Lord, I just done something I didn't want to do. But you know what happens when we put on the mind of Christ? Can you have the mind of Christ without talking to him at all? So see, it's a prayer line that keeps us continually in his word. In the Bible, the race that we run is also called a war. We war against the flesh, and that's what I was talking about. But God tells us how to put on the whole armor of God. In Ephesians 6 chapter, he tells us how to get dressed for this war. He tells us how to walk in the newness of life to believe. How many of you sometimes really feel like, well, I got the Holy Ghost, but there ain't that much newness of life. How many of you really feel like this? My life hadn't really been uh, uh, that new. I mean, I, I still struggle with old things and old pleasure and wants, the things that keep dragging me down, the weight that so easily beset us. Some people have a temper, and that temper beset us. Some people don't like themselves, and that beset us. Some people just are, don't like anybody else, and that just says, Come on, church. Some people find fault with anything and everything, and that just says, How can you ever think positive if all, you ever, if all that you ever do is think negative about everything and everybody? You'll be looking in the Mirror saying, My, I'm too ugly to live for God. <laughs> or you'll be saying, My, I'm too dumb to live for God. Mm-hmm. Or some people will even say, I'm not worthy to live for God. Right. That's the flesh talk. Yeah. If you just go in the bathroom about 99% of the day and take one look in the mirror and you'll find out where your biggest trouble comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, submit yourself unto God and the devil himself resist him. And what will he do? He will flee from you. And you submitted yourself to God when you came to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So see, you started off with a new life. You started off walking in victory. But you run in the bathroom about 30 minutes later and you saw the old man coming back. And the old man likes to do this and the old, this old man used to like to lie and, and uh, cheat and steal and drink and cuss and smoke and fight and everything else. And I promise you, that flesh has not left this body yet. It's still there. And uh, how many of you can can remember before you received the Holy Ghost? See it? Well, see it's still there. That mindset. That same mindset of when you, you, other people thought you was the worst thing in the world. Still there. And then sometimes it's hard 
to live beyond your old reputation. I saw somebody just, I don't know, I forgot who it was, but it was now, just recently, and uh, I, we was talking, I said, well, you know, I'm a Pentecostal preacher now. And he said, yeah, I heard that. Well, she didn't give me no kind of remark. And I think it was her, but you know, God can change anybody. She had to look at me with the thought, yeah, he, he had to, if he changed you. Those men hadn't been around enough to realize they had changed. But your life tells the story whether you've changed or not. Your life tells the story whether you're walking in victory or not. Praise the Lord. Romans 6 and 4 says this, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He said, you've been baptized, you received the Holy Ghost, you got his name stamped on you. Walk like him. Now I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I have overcome every temptation that's come against me. Because I'd be lying to you if I did. But Paul has overcome that easy temptation. Praise the Lord. I was in a restroom today and they had crawfish eggs in bell, crawfish pie. And I said, my God, that sounds so good. And I got me a plate of it. And Bruce, you know what? I could any time, I could have quit it, but I ate that whole thing. <laughs> so you understand where my name was coming from? We, we, haven't, we haven't won that total victory yet. But church, there is a victory that you can walk in yes. that you have not walked in as of yet. Walking after the Spirit, Romans 8 and 1, says, Therefore is there no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walketh after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now there's no, there's no condemnation if you walk in, after the Spirit. But when you walk in the flesh, and you, you all of a sudden you flinch and you say, Oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or I shouldn't have snapped at that person the way I did. When you're walking in the flesh. And, and believe me, we have to walk in this flesh every day. But the only way we ever going to find victory is to stay in the spirit of God. And I've said this a thousand times. I've said it, there's many spirits in this world. There's the Sister Lou Spirit. Then there's the Sister Lou Spiritual Spirit. Then there's the Brother Neville Spirit. And then there's the Brother Neville Spiritual Spirit. And then there's a happy spirit and a sad spirit. There is a bragging spirit and a pride spirit. Just all types of spirits in this world. There's an LSU football spirit. I knew I'd get a chuckle on that one. And then there's a Alabama spirit. Uh-huh, listen to that. Somebody's in the LSU spirit right now. And what we're doing, we're walking in the flesh when we do that, church. We allow fleshly things to eat our whole day up. And then we come to church and we're so drained that we have to drink of that cup and eat of that bread. And that's why you come to church so much and worship so hard, which we didn't do tonight. But that's why you sit so patiently and listen to the Word of God because it is meat or bread. The way you want to put it. And if you listen to what 
the preacher said or what the Word of God says, then you have something to stand on tomorrow and say, hey, I'm going to fight temptation today. I'm going to fight this flesh. But the best way to fight the flesh is fast for about five days. Or six, or seven. <laughs> or maybe even 14 or 24. Oh, come on now. We're doing a 21 day fast around here. What's the matter with y'all? I didn't say you had to starve yourself to death for 21 days. But you quit eating some of that junk for 20 day, 21 days that you eat all the time and eat some vegetables and things that God intended you to eat. You'll see some of that junk washed out of it. Ask the doctor if you don't believe me. They'll tell you the same thing. I'll I give you one quick example. You're a diabetic. You can't eat the this, 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 and this. And if you eat this, 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 and this, it's going to run your sugar up. And what happens when your sugar's up? You're crazy. You become a crazy man or woman. I do anyway. The next thing we need is faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now this is a real important. You can have faith, and, and we, we, we think about faith, there's the faith, the faith, which is the faith that we live in, we believe in Jesus Christ. And there's the faith that we can walk in victory. In victory. But when it talks about walking not by sight, but by faith, you can't pay much attention to what you see. You have to shut your, eye, shut your eyes and see only with spiritual eyes. You would, if you would shut your eyes instead of looking at somebody when they're really making you mad, I don't know about ever makes you mad. Do you? But if you would just, if you just shut your eyes, my I never forget one time. I got to tell you, my son told me I, I was so angry. I, I I didn't I wasn't living for God. And uh, he had his friend, and I didn't like him because I thought he had some sugar in his thing, <laughs> in the fluid. Praise the Lord. But, but anyway, I, I, I was just fussing about him just all the time. My son didn't run around with it, but my son knew it. And uh, my son told me one day, he said, You know what, Dad? He said, You're looking for the good in a man. You can see something besides what you see. Now, I didn't have the Holy Ghost at that time, and neither did he. But he had sense enough to know there is good in people beside man. And that's all we have to do. You know, our problem is that we see that our sight, and it don't look good, but we don't like it. It's sort of like this, you young lady, you see an ugly man, ugly young boy, <laughs> you don't like him. But you can't never tell, he might be a mighty fine fellow underneath all that ugliness. My mom always used to say, you and you you and me, the ugliest of the bone. <laughs> oh, God, what she said. <laughs> Worthy, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12. That ye walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now that never bothers me. I just be honest with you. I look at myself every day and say, Lord, am I really I, I don't see how in the world I could be worthy. There's no way that I could be worthy to walk the way you Tell me that I should walk. You've called me into your kingdom and, and, and to your glory, and 
I wonder how much glory I give you. And I just wonder how much of your kingdom do I think I'm running around in. That you walk worthy of God. That don't bother y'all. That bothers me. I wonder if I'm worthy to be called a child of God or not. And I believe if you keep wondering whether you're worthy or not, you'll keep trying hard to be worthy. But if you just give up and say, what's the use? Then you're giving into a fleshly temptation that you, your body just didn't want to do it to start with. You're going to get amen. Amen. Ooh, I had to ask for it. Abound in first Thessalonians 4 and 1 says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that ye, as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Now think about that. The more you please, the more you want to please. Because the more you please him, the more you can feel his approval of your walk with him. Can you say amen? amen. Have you ever prayed for somebody they got healed? Feels good, huh? Yeah. Have you ever heard testimony of somebody we've been praying for and there was a miracle work in their life? Feels good, don't it? Yeah. These are things we're called to do. And this is just a very few references in Scripture that refer to our experience with God. We must see in the following, we must, we must then see in the following, in the following of God's instruction that victory follows. As we find that way of experience. We're talking about walking in victory. We're talking about a way of escape. When you get by the temptation and you know that you're walking in victory. Let me put it to you like this. Has anybody here, how many of y'all, how many of y'all ever drank before you got drunk today? Amen. You don't have to raise your hands. I'm <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Since you received the Holy Ghost, have you been offered a drink? But you got by that, that temptation pretty easy, didn't you? Well, if you can get by that temptation that easy, we can get by these other ones real easy, too. Yeah. We just have to apply what we know of Scripture to our lives, church. That's all it takes. And then you can walk in victory. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you are empowered by the Spirit not only to begin a life of victory in which we will receive at the time of our departure from this life completely. Nobody can say no to that. Man, when you die, if you, the victory, if you live the life of God, the victory is there. Amen. Forever, eternal. No more. No more flesh. Jesus has ascended to heaven and have a heavenly body. Praise the Lord and come back. So we would know that's what we're going to get. Mm -hmm. You know how I know we're going to have victory in it? Because there's no sin in my hand. Mm -hmm. No sin. So then victory will be ours. Yeah, yeah. It's our job to recognize in this life, we war against Satan's aggression of our soul also to try to find a way of escape. Now listen, uh, here's, here's some reasons that Satan, uh, uh, Satan's objective according to Scripture is to steal, kill, and destroy. We must realize that he has 
some downfalls also. How do y'all realize we got some? Well, Lord have mercy. Amen. If you realize it, why did you let him keep on? Yeah. Yeah. Revelation 12 and 12 says this, Therefore rejoice ye heaven, and ye that dwell in thee. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, to the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because, what does he know? Because he knoweth that he had but a short time. You know, when you, when, when you think it's the devil messing with you, just simply remind him, hey, buddy, you better hurry up, because your time's running out. And then what you've got to see, you submit to God already. You resist to the devil. So now he's got to flee from you. Because he said, wow, that small little bit knows I ain't got a short time left. So then there is his ability to stop people from praying. He just can't do it. Matthew 4 and 10 says this. Then said Jesus unto them, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, oh, oh, again, he leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Remind him of who you worship the next time you kneel down and you feel like God is a million miles away. Now we talk about things that the devil does. Yeah. This is not necessarily our first place now. But the devil's trying to set up a barrier that you can't break, you try to make you think you can't break through it. But Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. When you tell the devil this and, and worship the Lord, then he don't have any choice but to leave. To leave. And then angels can come and minister unto you. Sometimes, when I'm sitting at my desk early in the morning with a fresh idea that I had prayed and asked God for, and my mind all of a sudden gets all entangled in the cares of this life. I just begin to worship a little bit. Then all that will leave me is some of the angels come, can come and minister unto me. Praise the Lord. And when you feel the presence of the Almighty God or His angels in a room with you, you get you walking in victory. Now, he's also limited his ability uh, to keep people in spiritual bondage. Uh, once you understand the victory that God has made available for them or for you. And again, I repeat James 4 and 7, Smith yourselves therefore to God, resist, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh, this is draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double minded. We must begin to think like Scripture tells us to. We need to hide the Scripture in our hearts that we won't sin against God. I never, ever just get out to pray. And if I don't use Scripture somewhere in my prayer, it seems to me like I'm fighting about 10,000 devils. But when Scripture begins to come forth in your mind, that's God and His angels doing battle for us. The devil is fighting the losing battle. Jesus has already gotten us the victory. God asked Jeremiah 50 and 44 in the Old Testament, For who is like unto me? And who will appoint me the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Not even Satan can defeat our God. And he proved it at the cross when he said it is finished. 
the rapes, the war, the battle that he fought was finished with the cross, church. He showed us the victory that we could have, the victory that we do have. The devil is limited in his desire to control your people's spiritual life. He cannot control your spiritual life. You allow your flesh to do that, not the devil. Once we have begun to live the life of victory and connect with the Word of God, Satan has to submit to the authority that is declared in God's Word. Job 41 and 10 says, None is so fierce that there stir him up, who then is able to stand before him. The devil is no match for God's word. So simply let us lay aside the flesh and live the way God really wants us to. And walk in victory. I hope this is it. Praise the Lord. Just remember some of the things that Brother Mayville said tonight. Tomorrow, you'll be able to walk through victory. And the next day, you'll be able to walk in a little bit more victory. And you'll just abound more and more. Because that's what the scripture says. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to God. The closer you are to God, He's right there. He's right there. You know, I, I, I hear a lot of people say, God's always there whether you are or not. I, I, I'm not for sure about that. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve pushed him away. They hid from him. They hid from him. He allowed them. And it wasn't just Adam and Eve, but if you look through the Bible, there's a lot of other people that pushed God away. He let them go until they draw a line to him. Look at Jonah in the belly of a whale. If he would have decided to draw a line to God, he'd have drowned him in the belly of that whale. So church, sometimes, Brother Maraville, when I was in the shape I was in, dying and going to hell, lost in sin. If it wouldn't have been me calling on God, that's where I'd wind up. In hell. This life is worth living. This victory is worth having. And this war is worth fighting. Because in that last day, He's going, to, he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never knew you. Or he's going to say, Amen, my good and faithful. I want to be that faithful servant. I want to be that servant that has fought. Paul said, he run a race and he fought a fight. Praise the Lord. He said he pressed towards the mark the high calling of God. There's something that we got to do. If you think this gets the Holy Ghost and going home and, and saying, Here I am, Lord, bless me this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. You ain't going to do you much good. It takes a relationship with God in every aspect of our life. It's so easy. One of these days, I'm, I'm going to study it out somewhere, I'll find a 50-50 chart somewhere about 50, maybe 50, no, probably about 50%, maybe 30% of the time we live for God and the other 70 we live for ourselves. Well, about maybe 1% of that time we live for the devil. So it acts us out living for God down to 29%. When you think about it, church, you think about what I said to you, we go to church three times a year. It's the most. Maybe four with prayer, prayer meetings, and a lot of times we don't go to prayer meetings. But four times is the most do we give God. How long have we been here? We ain't been here now. I've probably been talking. 
Jesus' name. 